Today we'll discuss Lady Lazarus, written by Sylvia Plath. Now, Sylvia Plath, as most of you would know, is often characterized as a writer in the confessional genre. She writes confessional poetry, which means most of the poems are about herself. But the problem is when we start identifying confessional poetry as biography or autobiography or you know narration of the self, confessional poetry mostly deals with emotions. And it is emotional veracity that we look for in Sylvia Plath rather than factual veracity. So I mean, I often tell my students never to judge Ted Hughes by reading Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath has to be read uh, in her own inimitable way. And we'll leave Ted Hughes aside because he is another great poet. Okay, Lady Lazarus was composed uh, in 1962. And uh, she was in a very disturbed frame of mind um, when she wrote this poem particularly because she was separated from her husband and living with her children separately in a different place. And there was an extraordinary outburst of creativity. And one of the poems that she wrote in this period of despair and great creativity was Lady Lazarus. So I'll begin by reading the first couple of lines of Lady Lazarus, and then we'll go into a line-by-line -line explanation. So this is how she starts. I have done it again. One year in every ten, I manage it. A sort of walking miracle. My skin, bright as an Abzi lampshade. My right foot, a paperweight. My face, a featureless, fine, dew linen. So from the very first stanzas itself, we understand that. This is a poem written about a very uh, traumatic moment in her life when she tried to commit suicide and the suicide attempt failed. And the metaphors that she has used are taken largely from the Jewish suffering in the Second World War. Because the uh, uh, trajectory of uh, Jewish uh, trauma runs like a leap motive in many poems composed uh, in England and in America. And in this poem, Sylvia Plath has also used the metaphor of Jewish suffering. And you will find constant references to this. So she says, I have done it again. Once one year in every ten I manage it. So it's an explicit reference to the multiple times when she attempted to commit suicide and she failed. So this is a, another time when she tried to commit suicide but fortunately for us she failed to uh, achieve success there. And I think Sylvia Plath's tortured soul is what makes her so intriguing to her readers. The, and. Uh, um, well, it is. I don't think it is proper to call Sylvia Plath a feminist poet because with confessional poetry, uh, you cannot include them, uh, you know, sort of push them into a particular genre at all. But in this poem, you will find a lot of references to the patriarchal norms which uh, objectify a woman and torture her woman and use her emotions in a very negative manner. That is something that we will see in the poem. But uh, let me caution you that uh, perhaps it would not be wise to categorize Sylvia Plath as a very uh, clear feminist writer. So the very first line she says, I have done it again, which means it is a repeated action. And one in every 10, I manage it. I try committing suicide and I fail. Uh, yes, so again, when we talk about Lady Lazarus, the title, let's begin with the title, it refers to a New Testament account of Jesus Christ, uh, resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. All right, I'm sure the biblical connotation is well known, and Plath's inspiration might have always also been from uh, the love song of Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot, where the hero imagines himself as a Lazarus come from the dead. Um, and um, in 1953, in summer, she had, uh, Sylvia Plath had taken an overdose of sleeping pills and she had uh, crawled underneath the space of her bedroom uh, fam in a family home. And she was discovered and brought back to life. So this is the real life incident that uh, motivated her or inspired her to write this particular poem. All right. So, uh, she says, a sort of walking miracle, direct reference to Lazarus. And please remember, in the first part of the uh, poem, the Lazarus she refers to is still in the tomb. All right? Uh, the dead Lazarus. In the second part of the poem, she talks about the Lazarus who's been resurrected. So please keep in mind the two different positions that uh, Sylvia Plath takes in this particular poem. 
So she says, a sort of walking miracle. My skin, bright as a Nazi lampshade. This is another reference to the Holocaust horror stories where Jews were killed and their skin was, made, was used to make several things and lampshades was one of the objects uh, used to make uh, using the skin of the Jews. Peel of the napkin, uh, uh, sorry, there's another line there. My face uh, featured as fine Jew linen. So Jew linen, it's a reference to the covering used to, uh, for dead bodies to cover them, uh, to cover the bodies of the dead. So Jew linen, a mixture of uh, cloth from cotton and wood is called Jew linen here. And this is what Sylvia Plath mentions. So she says, peel off the napkin, take off the napkin, the uh, covering of my face. And oh my enemy, do I terrify. So please remember the reference is to the dead body here. The body that is still lying dead. And that is why she says, do I terrify the nose, the eye pits, the full set of teeth, the sour breath will vanish in a day. The decomposing of the human body. And uh, there is a, uh, and many writers often think of the human body as something which will easily decompose, which will be eaten by worms, which is rotten. Uh, this is this hatred of the body is something which recurs in many writers and you find that here in Sylvia Plath also. She talks about it, the eye pits, the full set of teeth. You know, there's something scary about the full set of teeth as if it's leering at you and as if it's caught in the smile which cannot be closed. Uh, and the sour breath that will all vanish in a day, the body is easily decomposed. Soon, soon, the flesh, the great cave eight, will be at home on me. And I, a smiling woman, I am only 13, and like the cat, I have nine times to die. So this is a reference to the uh, common uh, proverb that it says the cat has nine lives. So she says, I've tried it 10 times, once in every 10 years, and this 30 now, I have another six more chances to go before I actually die. So I can keep trying. That is the sense that you should take it here, that she is not going to give up trying to die. Uh, trying to die is what makes her alive. Uh, she lives only to attempt death. This is number three. What a trash to annihilate each decade. So she feels that this is all my life is about. If I were to write my life story, and each decade is punctuated with an attempt of suicide, a suicide attempt. Each decade, there is an attempt to sui commit suicide. And that is how the story of my life is being written. And the next stanza is where we come in, the readers come in. She talks about the people who come to see her each time she's brought back to life by her family, by the doctors, by the, you know, the people around her who try to resurrect her. She says, the peanut crunching crowd shoves in to see, unwrap me hand and foot the big striptease. So here she talks about the people who come and look at her. You know, we know that uh, how we go and look at a sick person, an ill person, and what was wrong with you, what happened. But these questions, she says, it's an emotional striptease that I'm trying to, uh, you're trying to make me do here. You're trying to make me reveal my life, my innermost secrets as to why I try to commit suicide. And the peanut crunching, unthinking crowd, just as if we were going to see a movie, just as if we were going to the theater to see somebody else's suffering, where we are completely removed from that. So we get a sort of, you know, remember Aristotle's catharsis and the therapeutic pleasure in seeing somebody else's tragic suffering. In much the same way, Blath sees herself as a spectacle and we, the spectators, go in to look at her. She's not just talking about the people who come to, come to visit her after her failed suicide attempt. She's also trying to talk about us, the readers of this poem, who have all her voyeurs who are coming to prey on her in, or on her sorrow. Have, she's made it an art and we are the spectators who look at this art and gain some sort of pleasure. So she, uh, again, this is uh, calling attention to the body again. Gentlemen, ladies, these are my hands, my knees. I may be skin and bone. Nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. Uh, then in the next few lines, she goes back and she says, the first time I happened, I was 10. It was an accident. The second time, I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rocked shut as a seashell. They had to call and call and to 
pick the worms off me like a sticky toy. So uh, here he is, she's talking about the several times that she attempted to commit suicide and how each time, the first time she was just 10 years old and it was perhaps a dry run, she, was, she didn't even know what she was going to do, but that inner feeling calling her to end it all was very strong, that is what she means to say. And I think this is the, one of the most beautiful lines in the poem, she says, dying is an art. Like everything else, I do it exceptionally well. Again, calling attention to her life. She was a brilliant student. She excelled in many things, especially in writing poetry, as you can see. And she says, in much the same way, I see dying, the process of dying is an art. It is an aesthetic form that I have perfected. That, for me, it brings me great joy, even though I may fail. I guess you could say I've got, sorry, she says, I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say, I've got a call, which means it's my vocation. It's something divinely inspired. Like poets used to talk about how the muses descended on them and how they started writing poetry. In much the same way, the call to commit suicide is very strong within me, says Sylvia Clark. There's something aesthetic about committing suicide because uh, if you look at it from another perspective, you decide when you're going to die and that is something that has troubled humankind for a long time and this I think is a time when we are all conscious about death. Sylvia Plath says, I do it exceptionally well. She says, it's easy enough to do it in a cell. It is easy enough to do it and stay put. It's a theatrical. Come back in broad day to the same place, the same face, the same brute and you shout a miracle that knocks me out. So the process of entering the cave of death is rather easy. It's beautiful. It is sublime. I enjoy it. But when you bring me back and there is a brute shout, brute is a word very consciously used because she wants to say it is uh, cruel to bring me back to life. And then you look at me and you say it's a miracle. Hey, presto, she's alive. She's come back to among the living. And that is what makes me feel terrible. And she says there is a charge for the eyeing of my scars. There is a charge for the hearing of my heart. It really goes, my heart beats. And there is a charge, a very large charge for a word of touch or a bit of blood. So here, Sylvia Plath is talking about her body and saying that, you know, you can come, you can touch me, you can talk to me, but for each thing that you intend to do with me, you will have to pay. There is money involved. So, the, you know, you have to sort of give yourself to me if you want to look at me and if you want to touch me. Um, yeah, because she's a miracle. There's again a reference to uh, the uh, uh, Bible where, you know, you have um, the, or the uh, religion where you have relics and you have to pay to see, look at the relics, pay to touch them. So this is what Sylvia Plath is also talking about. Right. So, she says that, that this is where she says that for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. So, so her doctor, her enemy, again her doctor, H-E-R-R, -R, the German salutation. Again, like I told you before, the Nazi and the Jewish lives that she has brought in as metaphors to this poem that uh, doesn't celebrate, rather bemoans the coming back to life. I am your valuable, the pure gold baby that melts to a shriek your pure gold baby, which means your offer, your spectacle, the perfect vision that you have offered, and I melt to a streak. I, the next few words and lines show the great emotional turbulence that she was experiencing. I turn and burn. Do not think I underestimate your great concern. Ash, ash, you poke and stir. Flesh, bone, there is nothing there. So you burnt my body. Now the process of burning. And what is left there? A cake of soap, a wedding ring? A gold filling you after you burn the body this is all that remains everything else becomes ashes her god her lucifer you know the masculine form is used so she sees god satan as well as the doctor as men and this is what perhaps has prompted many um what do i say readers to sort of categorize plath as a feminist poet yes there are elements of feminism in uh, uh, plath um, which you know is coming out of her emotional torture, the feelings that she had experienced. Okay, and she says, "Beware, beware! Out of the ash I rise with my red hair, and I eat men like air." So in this part, it is Lazarus who has been resurrected. So I have come back to life, 
and I eat men like hell. The anger, the angst, the, um, what do I say, the passion which is there within her, which doesn't find an outlet because, you know, love which she carries within her, which is denied to her, has made her commit, try to commit suicide. And love that other people have for her has made her come back to life. But she knows that Sylvia Plath ends her poem by saying, her Lucifer, beware, beware, red hair like air, I rise from the ashes, she says. And this, she means she has a dangerous, uncanny power, the power that she has brought into herself. Again, there might be a reference here to Kubla Khan, you know, where uh, there, is, there is a line which says, all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Uh, so Sylvia Plath, in her poem, ends on a note of strength where she says, beware of me because I have strength. You have underestimated me, have treated me like a spectacle, like a joke, but uh, that is far from reality. And this is what will happen next. So this is how Sylvia Clark ends her poem. So uh, like we started uh, by talking about Clark and her confessional mode of poetry, Lady Lazarus sort of is a very important poem in that genre of confessional poetry, as well as the poetry of written by Sylvia Clark. I hope you find this video useful. Thank you very much.